from Microbe TV. This is Beyond the Noise, episode number 68, recorded on the 4th of June, 2025. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today is your host, Dr. Paul Offit. Hi, Vincent. Hello, Paul. This is the video version of Paul's column on Substack called Beyond the Noise, cutting to the chase on important health topics. Today, we're going to have a look at Paul's column entitled RFK Jr.'s War on Children. So let, let's talk about this, this war, uh, Paul. At the end of May, he made an announcement about COVID vaccines. What was that all about? Right, so he, um, on a three-minute video posted on X, he's with Marty McCarry, the FDA commissioner at his right, and Jay Bhattacharya, the head of the National Institutes of Health on his left, he said that we are no longer going to recommend COVID vaccines for healthy children or for healthy pregnant women. I couldn't be more pleased to announce that as of today, the COVID vaccine for healthy children and healthy pregnant women has been removed from the CDC recommended immunization schedule. What I was hoping we could focus on today was the children's part. So, so why is that wrong? The um, CDC, in the person of Fiona, Fiona Havers, in April of this year, presented data updating um, the Advisory Committee for Immunization Practices on where we stand with the current COVID epidemic. And what she said was that um, during the past year, there were 165,000 hospitalizations for COVID and 40,000 deaths. Now, most of those hospitalizations and deaths were in people who were older, who had chronic conditions, but um, there were roughly um, 6,600 hospitalizations and 150 deaths in children. A lot of that was in children less than four who are a profoundly under-vaccinated group. Only 5% of children in that age group are vaccinated. What was also interesting was that it depended on whether you looked at the zero to two-year-old or two to four-year-old, but between 40 to 60% of those who were hospitalized and died were previously healthy. One in five who were hospitalized were sent uh, to the intensive care unit. So what that tells you is that can, hosp can young children, children less than four years of age, be hospitalized and die even though they are previously healthy? The answer is yes. So what we had is we had a recommendation for all children to get a primary series of vaccines. And unfortunately, that appears to have disappeared. So not, it's not just boosters we're talking about. It's the primary series. So let me understand this. RFK Jr. is a lawyer and a politician. Makari is a surgeon. And Bhattacharya is a health economist. None of them have any expertise in public health or virology, they just decided to overrule a, basically a licensed vaccine it has been approved for use in these age groups, correct? Right. So the way this, I think this is all about Project 2025 in the end. If you look at Project 2025 under the CDC, what they want to do is eliminate the CDC as a recommending body. So the way this is settled out for children is that now any child between six months and 17 years of age uh, should have a shared clinical decision making with the physician. So what that does is it takes away the recommendation. And the minute that you, you take away is recommended or should be given, then it can no longer be mandated. Now, COVID vaccines aren't mandated. So the, the I don't know why they're targeting COVID. And maybe this is just round one of what is going to be an attempt to get the CDC to back off of any recommendations. But what upsets me about this is the way that they portray it. They say, what we want to do is we want to strengthen the relationship between the patient and the doctor. But doctors and other healthcare professionals look to the ACIP and they look to the CDC for recommendations because those are the people who have the data. I was at a meeting uh, yesterday of about 200 healthcare professionals and I said, how many of you know, you know, how many children were hospitalized and how many children died last year of COVID and whether or not they were vaccinated and whether or not they were healthy? And very few did. And that's why we look to the CDC for those recommendations. If you're asking all doctors in this country to understand all the primary data, that's asking for too much. Well, Paul, welcome to public health by edict, not by committee. That's the whole point of the administration. You know, the, the latest um, 
executive order, restoring gold standard science is basically taking the decisions away from committees and putting them in the hands of individual politicians even. It's, and this is the same thing. The way this should work is if you really are, are moving away from a routine, rec- routine primary series recommendation for children, because let's just focus on that for a minute. Um, what you would normally do is you would bring that question up before the advisory committee for immunization practice, mm-hmm. a group of experts in virology, immunology, public health, vaccinology, et cetera. They would uniformly recommend a primary vaccine series for the reasons we just talked about. This is a virus that can still cause children to be hospitalized and die. In fact, more children were hospitalized and died this past year from COVID than from flu, for which there is a routine recommendation. So they would definitely have recommended it. So to get around that, what you do is just what you said. You make it an edict. You stay, you have a three minute video post on, on X where you say, this is what we're going to do, as if it's been handed down on stone tablets from on high. You don't have <laughs> input from the ACIP. You don't have input from professional societies, you know, the, like the Amer- American Academy of Pediatrics. You don't have public comment. You don't allow none of it. You just state, this is what we're going to do. So is there any uh, scientific basis for him uh, withdrawing vaccines from these individuals? No, not the, it's the opposite. You have a scientific basis to have a primary care, a primary recommendation, primary series recommendation for all children in this country because all children are at risk. It's interesting. The immunization rate in children less than five is about, is about 5%. So it's, it's most children are not vaccinated. All children by the age of, of six months will be fully susceptible to this virus. Once the passively transferred antibodies from the mother following national infection or immunization, the mother will have worn off. So they're, they're completely susceptible by six months of age. The virus is still circulating. I mean, SARS-CoV-2 virus is a short incubation period mucosal infection. Even if everybody in the country were vaccinated every year, the virus would still circulate. So you have a, a circulating virus and, a, and an at-risk population. And if you look at the number of hospitalizations and deaths from children now, young children, children less than five, it's not that much different than at the beginning of the pandemic when there was a vaccine available because it's a highly susceptible population who's not being vaccinated. And so just to be clear, the immunization of pregnant women, I know you don't want to talk about that, which has been eliminated, that would protect these infants under six years, six months of age, right? That's exactly right. And that was also a significant percentage of those less than, than four-year-olds that were getting hospitalized were children less than six months of age. They're not going to benefit from any sort of active immunization schedule. They need passive immunization, either from um, the a mother, well, from a mother who was, um, who was vaccinated, so yet another reason to vaccinate a pregnant person, right? Yeah, and and beyond that, pregnant women are particularly susceptible to severe COVID because they're immunosuppressed, right? That's right. We're going to talk about that next time. Okay. So some some people argue that 150 child deaths is very small. We shouldn't worry about it. What do you say to that? So maybe it would be easier for people to handle this if we didn't do it as a statistic. Maybe it would be better if what we did is we listed all those children's names And that we interviewed each of the parents to see what it felt like to watch your child die of a disease which is preventable. Because that's the problem. I think, you know, it's the line from Stalin, right? We've we've talked about before. One death is a tragedy. A million deaths is a statistic. And when we keep talking about statistics, I think we lose something. But, But let me put it this way. If, if, we, if we eliminate the primary series or make it so that, that getting a primary uh, series for COVID vaccine in young children is something that's just a matter to discuss, there will be children who will die because of that. And, and, and they have names. We just don't know their names yet. And maybe if we knew their names now, we'd feel a little differently. <laughs> He's also waging war in other ways, right? Not just via COVID vaccines for children. Oh, oh, sure. I mean, it's, it's yeah, I, and we're suffering this. So I'm thinking about measles and pertussis, right? He's not really managing those properly. Right. So we have an outbreak of measles that's bigger than anything we probably had in decades. We've had three deaths from measles. It's more than we've had in the last 25, or the same numbers we've had in the last 25 years total. We had the first child death from this country since 2003. We have, we have 216 cases of influenza deaths in children this year, which has not been seen since the swine flu pandemic in 2009. We have states that have experienced pertussis deaths that haven't experienced pertussis deaths in years. And he says nothing about that. Nothing. We don't have a press conference at all on the fact that these these infections are not only hurting, but killing our children. So the CDC website still has the old recommendations. You think it's just a matter of time before it's updated? 
So the CDC website currently states that for children between six months and, and 17 years of age, they, they may get a vaccine based on shared clinical decision-making. Now, the good news, at least, is that the Vaccine for Children's program, which covers probably 35 million children in this country, can then insure it. Good. And, and private insurance companies, including Medicaid, can insure it and will insure it. So that's all good. But again, I think that, that right now, as it stands, there is not a routine recommendation for children to get a primary series. So if a parent wanted to vaccinate their child, how could they do that? They could. They go to their doctor and say, I want my child to get the primary series of vaccines at starting at six months of age or one year of age or two years of age. But yeah, they can do that. And it'll be paid for by insurance. So that's good. But I just think that by not having as a clear recommendation that, that a child should get a primary series, that will mean that fewer children will get a primary series. What I found frustrating is that he and Makari and Bhattacharya they make these announcements and they make you think that they're improving the public health. They're going to base it on real science now, right? And and people may think, oh, that sounds good, but it's not correct. No, McCary was asked the question actually at a recent press conference about, look, here's data showing that children are being hospitalized, children mm -hmm. are dying, and that they're healthy but unvaccinated. Um, don't you think it would make sense to have a primary series? And uh, And he said that he's not so sure he believed those data that he thought maybe those kids were just being hospitalized or dying from something else, and they just happened to also have COVID at the same time. We know the CDC data is contaminated with a lot of false positives from incidental positive COVID tests with routine testing of every kid that walks in the hospital. But if a child, if a two or three year old child comes into the hospital and is admitted to the ICU and dies, um, it, usually it's a single thing. It's just a surgeon who doesn't know anything about infectious diseases talking. And, and basically misinformation to make people think what they're doing is the right thing. It's terrible. It's really terrible. It's, yeah, it's all loosening of the, the vaccine infrastructure, much to our children's detriment. So, so if, if this happens, it seems like it will. You know, some, pe some parents will get their kids vaccinated anyway, but I think a lot will not. So we're going to see increased hospitalizations and increased death, right? Right. Here's the way it should have played out. The way it should have played out is, is here are the data, 6,700 hospitalizations, 150 deaths in children, a lot less than four years of age. Only 5% of children are vaccinated. We need to vaccinate our children with a primary series because they're under vaccinated. The virus is still circulating and the numbers of hospitalizations and deaths are not all that different from at the beginning of the pandemic when we didn't have a vaccine at all. So we need to vaccinate our children. That should be what a head of HHS would say, because any amount of hospitalizations or deaths that are preventable is unacceptable. Also, remember that you can be perfectly healthy and be hospitalized and die from this virus. So don't think that because your child is otherwise well, that they're not going to, to potentially suffer a severe or fatal illness. That's what he should be saying instead of the opposite. Mm -hmm. So anti-vaxxers often sue to get their way. Can we sue to restore the vaccine recommendations? I'm not a lawyer. I don't know how that works. I think the good news for parents is that they can get their yeah. child a primary series. I just think that they're going to be less compelled to do that um, because at least when you say, when you move from, yes, let's get make sure we, we recommend a primary series to you know shared clinical decision-making, that's a loosening of the recommendation, which I think would make any reasonable parent think, you know, maybe it's not so important to get this vaccine. This seems to be a test case for him loosening uh, the recommendations on other childhood vaccines like polio and hepatitis B uh, and MMR, right? I think that's the goal. I think the goal, if you ask Barbara Lowe Fisher, who was an anti-vaccine activist that sort of led the way back in the early 1980s with her dissatisfied parents together, which became the National Vaccine Information Center, if you asked her, what is it you want, Ms. Fisher? She would say the same thing every time. I just don't want vaccines to be mandated. Well, here, they're not mandated. COVID vaccines are not. As you said, they are just recommended. That's a big difference. You're right. They're not. But that sort of spilled over to let's just sort of take yeah. out the whole vaccine infrastructure. I just do not understand how some someone with no science background, just ideology, as you have said, can one-sidedly make these decisions. It's a different time, Vincent. I mean, um, the public health people that were the establishment are not the establishment anymore. The anti-vaccine activists who have been sort of shouting from the sideline for decades are now the establishment and they are making policy. 
Reminds me of Lysenko, right, in the Soviet Union. Uh, he had a bad idea about how genetics worked, but the Soviet leadership picked him because they thought he was right. And there it is, science by edict, not by committee, because the scientists would have said, you're out of your mind, Lysenko, you're wrong. And so they planted crops by his specification. They all died, and there was massive famine in the country as a consequence. And so here, what we're going to have is massive infectious diseases. And fortunately, in Russia, in the Soviet Union, they got rid of him. So, you know, it's going to take a lot of child illness and death to get rid of him, I suspect. No, I think politics is Trump science. I mean, the, the, the website COVID.gov used to be a source of information about COVID, about the COVID vaccine yeah. and COVID vaccines and how to get them, et cetera. And now... Um, it's not. It's it's the sense is, you know, we, the Republicans, won. Not only do we get to set policy in terms of just general public policy, we get to, to, to determine what is true about what, what happened with COVID. And so if you look on COVID.gov, you see um, a, a big sign that says the lab leak was real. You see, you know, Donald Trump looking like a character out of Blade Runner. And then all these other things about, you know, whether it's about social distancing or masking or ivermectin or hydroxychloroquine. We were right about all of that. And so we we're just going to reestablish that because you made fun of us the first time when, you, when we said those things, because it was shown not to be true by study after study after study. But now we simply declare it to be true. Just point out that lockdowns happened under Trump won, right? Well, Trump won, created Operation Warp Speed, which was one of the greatest scientific or medical achievements in my lifetime. He should be very proud of the mRNA vaccines that he provided to us very quickly by the end of that first year. Yeah, and now we'd like to get rid of them. <laughs> For no good reason, we should point out. And don't tell me about myocarditis, folks, okay? It's a, it's a reversible... Uh, illness, and um, it happens more frequently from COVID. So that's not an argument, and there's nothing else. So you call for RFK Jr. to resign. Do you think that's likely to happen? No. The, 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 he could voluntarily step down. That's not going to happen. Uh, President Trump could say, um, I am now going to replace you with somebody else. That's not going to happen. He could be impeached. That's not going to happen. So I, I, what's going what's to change things? I think as more and more cases of vaccine preventable diseases mount, as more children are hospitalized, as more children die, we may get to a point in this country we say, where we say it's enough. This man had this anti-vaccine activist, science denialist and conspiracy theorist has to step down. But I think, unfortunately, a lot of children are going to suffer before that happens. As Maurice Hilleman said to you years ago, right? That's right. That's exactly what he said with uh, very heavy art. We will put a link to Paul's column in the show notes so you can read all about it. That's Beyond the Noise with Dr. Paul Offit. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Vincent.